are such a genuine gem. Thank you for clicking on my video. I'm Brooke McKenna and today's case is a bit different because it's a compilation of many different cases or more so like stories and experiences that you guys have had. Now, I got this idea from the lovely Sherilyn Dale who also does true crime content here on YouTube. She is such a wonderful, empathetic, just absolutely amazing human being and I had always wanted to do some sort of survivor stories from you guys on this channel because every time that I did a survived video on a case that I had found, you guys would always leave me just little comments about things that you've been through or that it really helped you because you had survived too. And you guys know those are my favorite videos to create. And so I've always wanted to do something where I could bring your guys' stories to light. And then I saw Sherilyn doing it and I thought that is just so wonderful. She's so smart and she's so brave about just speaking her mind and doing what she feels is right. And so I, I did reach out to her. She was so sweet about it. And so... Yeah, with her permission, I would like to start doing the survivor true crime stories from you guys if it's something you guys would like to hear. And I will also leave her videos linked down below that she has done. Go and subscribe to her because she is the original person who did this. I don't want to take any credit for it. I just want to be able to share your stories and I've recently put out the email that you guys can send the stories into and I've already gotten so many just heartbreaking, inspiring, just overall I'm so grateful that you guys would feel like you can trust me enough to tell these stories and I don't take that lightly and I am just, I'm over the moon that I have you guys supporting me and I'm so incredibly grateful and so I want to tell a few of your stories today and if you would like to send me anything, the email is dearbrookeisurvived at gmail.com. I also want to make this a very, very kind comment section. I, we don't need any judgments, especially when these stories are from our own and you never really know in any case who is actually looking at the comments and what you say so this needs to be a very uplifting supportive community of people who care and that's that's what we're going to be down below so please stick to that without further ado let's go ahead and get into these stories i do want to say that a lot of them do have to do unfortunately with sexual assault or just childhoods that were abusive or that were hard to go through. I mean, these stories are very hard to stomach. And so if that's something you're not in the right headspace for, I completely understand. But I really think that they're important to share. So let's go ahead and start. Jenna said, this story is from December 25th, 2021. I was on the run from foster care and I was friends with people 15 plus years older than me. I was only 14 at the time. I was in a really bad way, living in a house with no walls, not even any insulation. The floors were concrete and I had a couch in one of the rooms I was sleeping on when a lady I'm going to call Sally came and woke me up to tell me two men, I'm going to call John and Mike, asked if I wanted to go cut down trees for a small business in the neighborhood that allowed people to come and get paid per hour just to help the little community. I agreed and got in the car. Both men were in their late 40s. I instantly felt uncomfortable when I realized that they were going the wrong way, so I asked them what they were doing and they said they needed my help moving a van at John's house. I thought it was weird, but I went anyways. I helped them and hours went by, but there were several people at the house, so I felt safe. I then asked him if he would drive me back to the place I was staying at the time because it was snowing and it was dark. He agreed. Later, when everybody went home, including Mike, I brought it up again and asked why we never went. He said that he had just got his paycheck and he would pay me if I cleaned out one of his rooms. I had so much stuff piled up. Oh, it had so much stuff piled up. It reached the ceiling almost. While cleaning, he asked if I could make him an egg sandwich. I'm the best at making egg sandwiches. So while doing it, I heard the door open and I went to see what it was. That's when I saw him tying wires to the handle of the screen door with jingle bells on them and attaching them to the doorknob on the inside. My heart sank, but I went back to the kitchen and pretended I didn't see anything. 
I went back to the room after finishing the sandwich and finished cleaning. It took hours, but when I was done, he gave me $50 and sat me down on the couch and asked if I wanted to play strip poker. I don't know how to play poker, but he said whoever had the best hand got to take a piece of clothing of their choice off the other. I obviously declined. I asked if I could go home and he said I should stay the night because it was so late and he needed to get gas. My house was less than a mile away. I pleaded with him, but he said no. So I soon gave up and as bad as it sounds, I asked to hit his meth because I didn't want to sleep. I was so scared I didn't know what to do and I hadn't done it before, but in the environment I lived in I saw it every day and I was very familiar with it, so he let me. I stayed up all night just staring at the wall while he tweaked on things in the room. The second day. Eventually after hiding in the bathroom, Mike came back with a girl and I remember looking at the girl with a look begging for help in silence. She saw the wires on the door and she saw how scared I was, but she did nothing. I eventually went to hide in the bathroom to cry, but then John followed me inside and asked if I needed anything. I said no, but he pushed his way in fully and stood in front of the door. He started touching me and eventually molested me, and I was bawling my eyes out. But then he asked me, what's wrong? I know it wasn't that bad. I was frozen. I was only 14 at the time, and I was only 100 pounds. I knew for a fact that I couldn't do anything without hurting myself more. I came out of the bathroom and went to sit on the couch where only Mike was there. I was so scared, I went to the room, I cleaned out, and decided to put on some makeup to try to get my mind off of what had just happened. Mike then came in the room and started touching my butt and calling me beautiful and saying I made his day. I didn't know what to do other than yell at him, but this pissed him off. So he went to John and he told him, but to my surprise, he kicked him out. After he left, he locked the door with the wires and asked if I wanted to partake in the drugs. I said yes. I hate it to this day, but I knew I couldn't fall asleep. Skipped some time and on the morning of the third day, I was sitting on the couch when he came and started to feel my legs. He then tried to take my pants off with me fighting the whole time. I felt like I was fighting for my life. He tried to rape me but I wouldn't let him. So he just molested me and pleased himself. And when he was done, he went to the bathroom to shower. When he got out, he was acting so nice towards me and gave me a hundred dollars, like I was a sex worker. I felt so disgusting, but I didn't want to take a shower there. Hours later, he tried making advances toward me so many times with no avail from me. Mike came back around 10 p.m., I would say, and I knew it was time for me to leave because I wouldn't let both of them ruin me forever, possibly kill me. John said he wanted some marijuana and hearing this, I made a plan. I told him my friend two streets down would sell him a half for $30 and he offered to take me. I told him it was okay that I would just ride his bike because he was low on gas. He agreed and let me go. I rode the bike so fast to the trailer park down the street where my ex's mom lived. I was hysterical. I hadn't slept in what felt like years, and it was obvious I was on drugs. I couldn't form words for what he had done to me. She was just getting more and more angry at me and kicked me out for being high. I was left alone on the street knowing he would know I was missing and not coming back soon. I was scared and cold and vulnerable. I eventually got back to the place that I was staying and told Sally what happened to me. She could care less and just asked if I could spot her $20 for dog food, and I felt so alone. When I told people they didn't believe me or they blamed me for going to them in the first place. I left my bags over there and it had most of my stuff in it, and I brought one of my closest friends at the time. Let's call him Ronald. He brought a baseball bat with nails on the ends and promised nothing would happen to me. I got my stuff, and that was the end. That was the end and I couldn't turn him in because I was on the run from foster care and I didn't want to go to jail. But it's been two years now and I'm slowly getting over it. I had to deal with more trauma and betrayal because Ronald ended up grooming me and manipulating me into a relationship with him that he covered up by calling it what best friends do and forced me to send photos of myself where he would leave me and not be my friend anymore. 
Eventually, I matured and realized what was happening and soon after cut him off and ruined his relationship with his wife at the time. But I'm okay now. I'm no longer on the run. But no one believes me to this day and it hurts inside. But hopefully one day he will get the karma coming to him. Wow. That is where it ends. Except for she did say some very wonderful sweet words. Um, and she titled this my near kidnapping story. First of all, Jenna, I want to tell you that none of this was your fault. I believe you completely and I know that so many people listening to this video is going to believe you as well. This is something, you were 14 years old, but no one at any age range deserves to go through this but especially a young girl who doesn't have anybody supporting her. It's not your fault for going with these men. You did not know where to go, where to turn to. In fact, you were doing a wonderful job trying to find a job for yourself. And being on the run from foster care, which can be a horrible situation in itself, at that point, you really were surviving already at only 14 years old. And I think you've overcome so much in your life and I am so, so proud of you. If nobody's told you that, I am so proud of the woman that you've become and how you got through all of this and your survival and your determination to survive. You escaped this kidnapping, this hostage situation, and you did that all on your own. That was within you, that, that strong, that fearless person. But overall, Jenna, thank you for sharing your story and thank you for believing yourself because I know a lot of the times we can tell ourselves, especially when no one else is believing us, that maybe we're the crazy one. Maybe it didn't happen the way we thought. Maybe it wasn't as bad. Those thoughts are not true. They are also the enemy. And to be able to tell your story and tell the truth, be so completely honest, that it shows so much bravery. And I'm sending you so much love and healing in the years to come. The next story is from a girl named Kat. I won't give her last name because she didn't mention anything about wanting to be anonymous, but we'll just call her Kat. And the subject line says, justice for my dad. She said, hi Brooke, I would like to take the time to bring light onto one of the darkest times in my life. On a Sunday afternoon in 2019, my mom and I were just chilling outside after a regular mall trip with my dad that happened the day before. We received a phone call from him. To clarify, my dad didn't live with my mom and I at the time. When my mom picked up, we heard a woman's voice, so my mom hung up thinking it was just the wrong number. The number called again, and I replied, and they asked if we were the family of my dad's. When we replied yes, the person on the other line told us that my dad was in the hospital. We didn't actually believe it since he was the one who drove us to the mall the day before, so we were in shock. We now know that the person speaking was a nurse who had told us my dad's full name and that he had been hit by a car as he was the pedestrian walking across the street and they asked for us to come to the hospital right away. Fast forward two weeks later, my dad died from a fat embolism which spread into his brain along with other injuries that were caused when the pedestrian collision occurred. My relationship with my dad barely existed even though we lived in the same house for almost all my life at that point. Not helping that this was the first death I had ever experienced, which left me feeling extremely confused on how I should be grieving and completely changed my thoughts regarding life and death. The most heartbreaking part was finding the person who killed my dad and having my lawyer not charge him. So this 19 year old man never went to prison along with his 17 year old girlfriend who was in the passenger seat. The police report told my mom and I that this man hit my dad on a green light left turn while my dad was walking on the crosswalk. He and his girlfriend proceeded to move my dad's body onto the back seat of the car. At this time, my dad was still conscious. My dad had never been to the doctor or hospital for as long as I've known him. Therefore, he told the killer to just take him to his desired location as that was why he was walking in the first place and then to go home. 
since they were very close to his apartment. Sometime around there, my dad lost consciousness, and the killer decided to drive him around for about an hour or more until deciding to finally get him to the hospital. The furthest one possible, it seems like. Anyways, for all my life, my dad got strength through life's hardships. He always had confidence to stand up for what he believed in, while teaching me how to be positive through tough situations. He defined what strong was. He knew what it took to be independent, and he used his intelligence to achieve a successful life. He came from his country to America, and actually was the first non-American man to graduate one of the best military schools in the United States. I hope someday this killer will get his karma, as he nor his girlfriend has once reached out to apologize for what he has caused. I later found out from my friend that he actually saw this man on the same college campus as me. Imagine walking past the one who killed your dad without noticing it was him. Thank you for listening to my story, and thank you, Brooke, for reading love your channel. Oh my goodness, Kat, I am so, so very sorry for your loss. You know, what gets me the most, even if they didn't have enough to charge, the fact that this man or, you know, this 19 year old and his girlfriend didn't even have the decency to come and apologize, to at least send you flowers. That's the least they could do. The most they could do is try to be a part of your life, try to make this extremely tragic situation a little bit better and the fact that you have to go to college with him and he's just out and about when you know that your dad could st still be here if it wasn't for him i'm very very sorry that you had to go through all of this that you and your mom and i'm sending you guys so much love he sounds like a wonderful man and i love that you added in how he was and who he really was as a person. Those are such important details for us to just get to know him. I just, I hope your father is resting in peace and I hope you know that if you believe in it, he is most likely looking down on you and so proud of the woman that you've become today and how much you are strong. All right, the next story is from a girl named Phoenix. That's what we will call her in this story. She says, I'm not sure where to begin. My story took place November 18th, 2015. It's when my world as I know it came to an end. It was in my mid forties, divorced and supporting my college age daughter and then boyfriend. I had gone through a very nasty divorce that I thought had left me at rock bottom only five years before. Now during my divorce, my ex emptied my retirement account and had my car repossessed while I was at work, repeatedly accused me of abusing our two children and ended up with everything. The house, both cars and joint custody of the kids. I was working as a commissioned salesperson at Sears. It was in the hardware department and I was the lone woman in the group. I had to work twice as hard as the men, most of whom had been there for decades. I wasn't guaranteed any sort of pay if I didn't make the sales. I had to study so hard to learn the different tools, how different lawn equipment like lawn mowers, tractors, and pressure washers were used, how to mix paint, and how to sell credit cards, add-on equipment, and the protection plans. I was often faced with men who wouldn't want to talk to me or wouldn't let me sell everything to them. Then went to a man to ring them up, which meant that they got my commission instead of me. It was so hard. And yet eventually I started to get some bigger sales and was noticed by management. I was moved to the gym program, growing emergent managers and becoming the floor lead. I started taking over a lot of the manager's roles and eventually made best in blue and tools. It was a recognition program that went off the number of sales and satisfaction scores. I was the only woman who had ever made best in blue, not only in the district, but the state and had the highest scores in my region, which was never broken before sales went out of business. Oh, wow, that's incredible. I took a sideways promotion to assistant manager at Kmart, which is Sears' sister holding. We were able to move out of the bad neighborhood we had been living in and moved into a new apartment that actually had windows that opened, a working air conditioner, and the best of all, no nightly shootings. Oh my god. Then things bottomed out. I was at a job I loved, moved into the HR office, and Kmart went out of business only months after we moved. I remember when that happened. It was heart-wrenching and I was in despair that we'd soon be homeless. I struggled to get another job and was lucky to get a job with Dollar General as a store manager. 
no assistant manager position anymore for me. I was I was getting a regular salary and could afford the apartment and to help my daughter with her college expenses. I had to work hard. It was still a man's world I was living in. And now that I was the general manager, I had to work even harder and longer hours. I would sometimes work 120 hours a week. If staff didn't come in or quit, I would work the shift. And sometimes it isn't generally known, but Dollar General prides itself in serving the lowest 10% of the population, which usually means not the greatest neighborhoods. My store was no exception to this rule. I was in a horrible location downtown. I improved it though. I got it cleaned up, the shelves stocked, and started to raise the sales with proper ordering and staffing. I was proud of the job I was doing and felt like I was really making a contribution to the community. How naive I was. I should have guessed that the long hours would wreak havoc with my relationship, but I was blind to the fact that my live-in boyfriend was not faithful while I busted my behind to keep a roof over our heads and make it comfortable living for all three of us. Now, November 18th, 2015 was a cold day. I was working the closing shift with one cashier. It was near Christmas, so I was busy working on putting up the Christmas displays and getting the product on the shelves. It was 10.30 or so at night, and I heard a few people come in, and then out, and then suddenly I hear my cashier saying, I can't open the safe. I peek around the corner, and there is a kid in all black with his hoodie up, a bandana over his face, and a sawed-off shotgun. I tried to call 911, but he turned to me, and I managed to get the phone into my front pocket before he could see. He pointed the gun at me and told me to open the safe. Now, Dollar General has the stupidest design they've ever seen. The counters are U-shaped with the safe in the bottom of the U. That means it's on the sales floor and you have to be on the floor with your back to the door to open the safe. I don't know how just a few minutes could become hours, but they did. I could hear my heart pounding in my ears as I held my hands up in the air and told the kid that I had to get the key out of my pocket to open the drawers to the registers. He poked me with a gun as the cashier I had cried and shook on the floor, curled up in a ball. He directed me to put the money in a bag and then open the safe. I did as he directed. Then he backed up and motioned with the gun for us to get up. He kept his back to the cameras and led us to the stock room. He never faced a camera, as if he knew where they all were and which ones worked and which ones were dummies. He took us to the one part of the stock room that was blind, that no cameras reached. He reassured the cashier over and over at least two to four times, you know I'm not going to hurt you, and motioned for her to get down. He patted my breast with one hand on the trigger and the other hand on me. Then he grabbed at my behind. Apparently, he was satisfied with that. I didn't figure out until after he left that he'd been checking me for a phone and how lucky I was to have shoved it in my front pocket. Then he had me lay down on my stomach, my ankles crossed and my hands outstretched. He told the cashier again, I'm not going to hurt you. And he shoved the gun against the back of my head and slammed my face into the cold concrete. Time stood still. I could see the cashier's tears hitting the concrete, taste the blood in my mouth, hear the heart pounding as he told us not to move, and then, bang, he shot me. I don't know who was looking over me that day, because the gun misfired. I felt the impact, but the cartridge didn't erupt into my head. My life was spared somehow. I counted to ten. Oh, I have chills. Pulled, the, pulled out my phone and called 911. By the time I had the strength to get up and stumble towards the door, I walked straight into another gun pointing at my face. Fortunately, it was a police officer. I don't remember much of the rest of the night. I remember going to the hospital and then sleeping for days and days. I couldn't get over it. I should have been dead. Someone wanted me dead. Someone tried to kill me. It went round and round like that over and over, but that wasn't the worst. While I was in the hospital, my wonderful boyfriend, I say that sarcastically, moved in with another woman. I lost it. I was determined to end my suffering and pain and ended up spending several months in a mental hospital to recover from the loss and devastation. My dog died and my daughter moved on campus and I was alone. I thought my life was over. I felt like there was no meaning in life. Everything was a shade of gray. Surely, this was rock bottom. Except it wasn't. I had counseling through a workman's comp and the doctor said that I could return to work but not at the same location. It was too traumatic. So they moved me to a worse location. 
and only a few weeks in at this new location, the district manager came to talk to me about my performance. She took me into the office and it got worse. She turned off the CCTV and then told me I was going to be moved to another store. One that had armed robberies almost weekly and a horrible reputation. And I was going to be taking a demotion because my performance was not acceptable. How the hell was my performance supposed to be great after what I'd already gone through? And if you want to demote me, take away my pay and put me in a store where the previous store manager was shot and killed? She literally locked me in the office and pounded at me about how badly my work was now and that they had babied me enough and I was going to sign the form or she wouldn't let me go. For hours, she hounded me until I could hear my heart pounding in my ears again and I told her that I was going to be sick. Once I got to the bathroom, I was able to text a friend and ask them to call the police because I was being held hostage. Outside, I could hear her talking about how she was waiting for me to come out to one of the other workers. They needed a manager and I was the only one there. My opening. She decided to deal with it. While she was up front, I slid out of the bathroom and out the side door and went straight to my car and never went back. I got a tiny settlement for being shot and I lived on that for a couple of years while I went to therapy and learned how to deal with my PTSD. I learned to love myself and start seeing the world in color again, and I eventually got another job. I met a wonderful man, and he is understanding of my trauma and supportive of my recovery. He loves me for me, and he asked me to marry him. Congratulations. Oh, it should have been my happily ever after, but it's not. You see, he's a general contractor, and he took a five-week job in Turkey while I got ready to marry him. Turkey went on three-month lockdown. Some people stole equipment from the job site and the company took his passport and held him personally responsible for the missing equipment. He has until March to replace it. That's $46,500 worth of equipment. He had a heart attack from the stress and found out he needs a triple bypass, but we've already hit rock bottom and we've managed to raise $37,500 of the money. Wow. We're hovering at a little over 9,000 and have a GoFundMe to try to raise the money so he can be home for Christmas. Oh, I will leave that GoFundMe down below if you would like to help her out. She said, I, I'd love for you to share this story. It's not the black night of the soul that it was. It's about self-discovery and learning that you are stronger than you thought you could be. It's about losing it all and coming back from the depths of hell. It's about utter misery turning into bliss. It's a story and it's mine. And I want people to know that you can have a horrible period and come back from it. It's not the end of the world. It's just the beginning of a new one. Keep doing the good that you do. Brooke, oh, thank you. It gives us all hope. You guys give me hope. And I love that ending that she wants to say that you can overcome this and she has been through so much but to have that positive outlook and it takes a lot of healing to have a positive outlook. So. If you've been through something and you're not there yet, that's okay too. It takes some time to get to a point where you can say, you know, I'm grateful, not for what happened, but for how I dealt with it, for how I overcame it, and to still be positive. But there will come a time in your life when that is something that you can feel. So don't give up on trying to find that feeling. Okay, so this one is a little bit of a shorter one. It's by a girl named Anna, and her mom's name is Jan. Now she said, my mother was walking out of a hospital and a man who was in the front somehow ended up behind her. Something seemed off, so she took the main path directly across the parking lot instead of the short distance to her car, smart lady. She cut across quickly, jumped in her car and locked the door. She went straight home. Later that night though, the new set of woman was attacked and raped in that same parking lot. My mom knows in her gut that it was the man following her. She says her biggest regret is not turning back and getting security. I'm just thankful she has always been a quick thinker. For her to survive that and to also just feel guilty for not trying to help the woman, what a beautiful soul. I'm so happy that she survived this and I'm so heartbroken for the woman that this did occur to. I think your mom has nothing to blame herself on. We go into, you know, fight or flight or fawn or freeze. Sometimes in those situations, you have to be selfish. You have to just get out. And I'm sure if, if there was a chance to, your mom would have 
gone and she would have told people and that just unfortunately wasn't how it was supposed to be or not how it worked out but your mom has nothing to blame herself for this was the man's fault this man is the monster and i think that's something that we all struggle with is feeling when these monsters do things maybe i could have done something better maybe i could have saved that person or maybe i could have saved myself but that is putting the blame on the wrong person. You are not to blame. Those people are not to blame. This monster is to blame. And we really have to remember that because we don't want to take away any of their evilness and try to claim it as our own. And your gut instinct, you follow that. And that's so incredible. Stories of gut instincts being followed will always make me so happy. It's something we have to listen to. Tiffany said, I know others have had far more terrifying experiences, but I wanted to share my story with others who might think their situation isn't that bad. I love that. Every situation is just as valid. Trauma is trauma, no matter how small. So I love that you put that in there. Okay. In 2009, I met a guy, Bill. He lived in my apartment complex and he was the dad of my daughter's friend, which is how we met. We dated off and on for a year and a half and I tried to break it off because he was controlling and jealous. I wasn't allowed to go to the gym or talk to any of my friends, especially males, even though I'd known most of them my whole life and considered them family. Oh yes, that... Please know that if your life is being micromanaged in any way that like a boss would do at work, but with your own personal life, red flag immediately. That's not okay. A boyfriend should not make you feel bad about living your life. And that's not to say that any women who don't see these red flags are dumb or are to blame. It's just something that I'm hoping to bring more awareness to so more women are more aware because it's totally okay if you're not. One night I'd gone out for drinks with my best friend Brandy and Bill found out. I'd parked in the back where staff parked so he wouldn't see my car and I could have some girl time. He came in, dragged me off the bar stool by my hair. He drug me outside and called me all sorts of awful names. This was it for me. I was done. I broke up with him and that's when the stalking started, he followed me to work, a retail store, and even came inside to see if I was really there. My supervisor banned him from the store and then he'd call and ask my coworkers for my schedule. Every time I came home from the store or work anywhere, he was sitting in my parking spot to see if I was alone. Oh my goodness. I tried getting a restraining order and was told he wasn't dangerous and was denied the order. Why does that happen to so many women? He continued texting and harassing me and I did my best to ignore and avoid him. One night he was drunk and was convinced I had a sweatshirt. He kicked in my door, threatening to kill me. My kids and I, kids were 14, 11, 9, and 8, all held the door as he was trying to get in. Oh my, that is the most heartbreaking thing I've ever heard. Police arrested him on breaking and entering, but released him 24 hours later. I changed my phone number and he went to my phone company, said he was my dad. I was 26 and he was 40. And I changed my number without permission and they gave him my number. I got it changed again and he became friends with my kid's dad and got my number out of his phone. He texted me, what happens to your kids when you go missing? I tried getting an order of protection and the female judge said, he's just upset you won't talk to him. He's not going to hurt you and denied it. That is the most infuriating thing. Three months later, I was on a date at a bar and Bill walked in. I wanted to leave my, but my date said I needed to stop running from him. We went outside so my date could smoke and we planned to leave after. Bill followed us and started saying awful things, calling me a whore and worse. I ignored it the best I could and eventually Bill came up to us and said, is it time for you to leave? By this time I was emotionally exhausted from the months of harassment and stalking so I looked him in the eyes and said, isn't it time for you to mind your business? I love that. But this was a bad choice because he punched me so hard I fell to the ground. My head bounced off cement and I had a seizure. While this happened, the bar staff drove Bill home so the police wouldn't arrest him. He talked to us for a bit, but I can't remember what was said. My date told me I was fine and wouldn't let me go to the hospital. What is wrong with him? The next day, I went and found out I was bleeding on the brain. For six months, I didn't know who my kids were. I knew they were my kids, but I couldn't remember names or anything. 
I had excruciating headaches for a month. 10 years later, I still have migraine, PTSD, and anxiety because of this. I had to drop out of college because of the memory problems and migraines. The worst part was when he was finally arrested, he got three days in jail and he got to choose when to serve him so he didn't miss watching football or his birthday. Oh, and a 50 feet no contact order as well. I moved out of that apartment a few months later and out of the city a year later. I've cut ties with anyone who associates with him, even my kid's dad. My kids are adults now. I have a guard dog and a security camera on my porch. I rarely go out alone, even to the grocery store. I know I'm safe. I know he's nowhere near me, but I'm still anxious. That is extremely valid. However, I recently enrolled in school and I'm working on my business degree. I work at a dog daycare and I know he'll never accidentally come in. Unlike when I worked at restaurants and retail stores. I don't really date, but that's not entirely because I'm afraid of going through this again. I'm focused on my school, my family, and I'm looking forward to becoming a grandmother in a few weeks. Congratulations. I've grown and I've set boundaries with people. If you know exactly where I live, even close friends, it's just a way I prevent anyone accidentally telling someone who might know him. Overall, I'm happy. I'm still in therapy, still having nightmares, migraines, and memory problems, but I'm safe and not afraid anymore. It terrified me to think how close I came to dying that night. There have been situations where someone was punched once and didn't survive. There's countless others who have had abusive situations they didn't escape. I'm blessed. I thank God every day I was able to see my kids grow up, graduate, and become wonderful adults. Wow. What a story. I love that you talk about that it's still something that's present today, even though you don't let it fully run your life, but it's still there. I think that that's a good lesson for people that it, trauma doesn't just go away. You can't just heal from it completely. We will often, always have it somewhere in our being, but it's how we deal with it, how we work through it. And your story was so wonderful to hear about, so inspiring and the fact that you weren't helped by anyone and a lot of people just made excuses for this man is not okay. But I hope you and your children are doing great. And that, that part about your kids helping you hold the door really broke my heart. And they saw how strong that their mother was. And I'm sure that they look up to you as well. This is another short one by, let's see. Casey. She said, this is something I don't really talk about and the only person that knows about this is my best friend. So here we go. Thank you for allowing us to hear it, Casey. So back in, I believe it was 2015, I was 19 years old and I was having problems living in my mom's house. So I left to stay with a friend that I've known since I was 14. We almost dated when both of us were in high school and at first everything was going well. Then we got into an argument. I don't remember what exactly it was. And I said, F you. The actual word and then something flipped in him and he started to yell saying that I was mooching off of him I was a piece of crap and then he threatened to kill me he said he was going to trap me in his house and burn it down with me in it and then he left right after I thought he was completely gone I just started to walk I was in the middle of nowhere in New Jersey and it was late at night I was really lucky I had someone who could pick me up I can't go to that area again without having really bad panic attacks. It really could have been so much worse if I didn't have my friend. Thank you for doing this. It was really good to finally tell someone this. I'm so thankful that you allowed me to read it, to get it off your chest, and I really hope that it helped to tell the world. That is horrifying. And you saying F you to him was not an excuse for him to completely turn psychotic. And I hope that this man is getting serious help for his anger. And it's so scary how sometimes the people that you know can just completely switch like that. I love that you said that something flipped in him because that's something that a lot of people don't talk about when it comes to these psychopaths, sociopaths, or just manipulative people that they can sometimes be the sweetest people, especially at first, or if you don't know them very well, they come across as charming, adorable even, because this can happen in children as well. Adorable, so cute, oh, I love them. They're the best person at the party. But then something very small can set them off. And a lot of the times they don't let, you know, everybody they know, know about this. So then you're left like, 
why is this happening to me? Where is this coming from? Well, it's not that you brought it out. It's not that you did anything to make this occur. It's that that is in them and they only show certain people so they can keep up that facade. There are so many emails left. There are so many of your stories that I want to get to and feel free to send any more in that you want to as well. But I think that's where I'm going to stop here because I know that these can be very hard to listen to, very overwhelming. And I'm sorry if you can hear the wind outside this whole time. I don't know what's happening. Again, I just wanna thank each and every one of you if I told your story today. Thank you for sending it in. Thank you for trusting me. I will keep saying that over and over because it's important to note that I know that it's hard to tell these things. It's not something you were just sitting there happily typing to me and it, it can be a relief afterwards, just, you know, as therapy is and talking things through. But there is an element that is extremely hard to go back into that mindset. I absolutely acknowledge that. And I'm so, I'm so grateful that you trust me enough to write it all down and give me your actual name. Even if you want to be anonymous to the internet, I have some of your actual names and I don't take that for granted. I don't, sorry. I just want you guys to know that I truly do care and I truly take this with my full heart and I, I, these stories have broken me and as much as it's hard to read and I know it was extraordinarily harder to go through. Overall, I want you to know that I hear you, I believe you, and this was not your fault. None of it was your fault. Those are the three things that I think every survivor deserves to hear. So please let me know if you would like any more of these videos. I know that they can be very hard to stomach. Remember, you can email me your story, whether it's a survivor story, whether it's true crime, at dearbrookeisurvived at gmail.com. And I love you so, so very much with all my heart. So don't forget to speak up. Your voice is powerful enough, and I love you to absolute pieces. Remember to go check out Sherilyn Dale, who's the original, the OG of the stories. She does a wonderful job. She's a wonderful human. Okay. Bye.